Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is episode 29. This is Ingram Angle from Washington tonight. Thanks for joining us. First, Biden's plan to destroy America. That's the focus of tonight's angle. But were the former president to win this election, uh, we would have little hope of, of uh, saving American democracy in, in the near, near future. Buying power goes down every month with this president. I mean, if wages are not staying up with inflation. And it, I mean, I just don't I don't get what Biden's trying to do other than destroy this country. Donald Trump is continuing his campaign of projection. Everything that he says about Joe Biden is things that he says himself he will do. He is running his campaign of retribution, right? He is going to indict those that are against him if he becomes president again. He's going to throw them in jail. He wants to shut down this very network, right? Mm -hmm. He has said MSNBC must go. Um, and so he is telling us everything that he wants to do, and he's saying it out loud. This time, unlike 2016, we need to believe him. With a steady stream of commentary like that, it's no wonder Americans see the other side as an existential threat. But here's the real issue that both parties actually agree on. Will the other party's agenda destroy America? 81% of Democrats believe this about Republicans. 79% of Republicans believe this about Democrats. Now ask yourself, how's anybody going to bring this country together when right now this is what the two parties think of each other? It feels like all we hear these days is bad news, right? Experts telling us about the problems, the science behind them, the endless cycle of division. But amidst the negativity, there's a growing hunger for solutions, for actionable steps that can bridge divides and build understanding. And that's what we're going to talk about on this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. I'm your host, David Beckmeyer, and today we'll be joined by a leading expert in conflict resolution and social psychology whose insightful work on polarization has been hailed as essential reading for our current times. I'm Peter Coleman. I'm from Teachers College. I'm a, psych a psychology professor there and at the Climate School, uh, and I study peaceful societies. Coleman's groundbreaking book, The Way Out, How to Overcome Toxic Polarization, offers practical strategies for fostering understanding and bridging divides, and his expertise has been featured in numerous publications and media appearances. Dr. Coleman's research and personal experiences have made him a leading voice on the topic of social cohesion. He'll share with us concrete strategies that each of us can implement to combat polarization and promote positive change in our communities. So buckle up because this conversation is packed with hope and practical advice. You'll learn how to break free from the echo chambers, how to listen with empathy, and how to engage in civil discourse even with those you disagree with. By the end, you'll be armed with the tools and the inspiration to become a bridge builder, a champion of understanding, and a force for positive change in the world. Let's dive in. You have written extensively on this topic. And as we talked about a little bit, I would, I would categorize you as sort of a cornerstone in this whole bridge building space. Um, and I, I, you know, and, and so there's so many directions to go in there. But I, one thing I like about the, a lot of the work that you've done, it's something that my audience seems to crave is sort of more prescriptive kind of ideas. Because uh, everybody, a lot of the scientists I talk to and others, authors and others kind of tell us what's broken and how terrible things are, but they don't often have a lot a prescriptive sure. advice. But yeah, so but before I jump into that, uh, thank you so much, Peter Coleman. I know your time is very valuable. And I really appreciate you making the time. Of course, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so you have a you, you I mean, you've done written so much, but one of your works is uh, uh, the book, the, the way out. And, um, and then you've also written on that book quite a bit and on that topic quite a bit. And um, 
you've used, I, I don't know if you coined it initially, but you kind of use this term, the exhausted majority, the exhausted middle majority. I've heard that term used a little bit more. And, and I like the term. I think that's kind of who my audience is. <laughs> so right. I'm, I, sure. I, can you tell us a little bit about that concept? Yeah, I believe it was coined by a group called More in Common that studies political polarization around the world, uh, but, you know, have focused a fair amount um, in the U.S. And the exhausted middle majority is, is exactly that. It's the majority of Americans that, um, you know, are not on the extreme wings of left or right. Um, some lean one way, a lot of us lean one way or the other way, but basically are more moderate in our opinions and today are just exhausted and fed up and tired of the status quo and hate the vitriol and screaming matches that we see on the news and political debates and campaigns um, and are looking for something else. We're looking for an alternative. Um, so, you know, that's, in my view, given the, the, the long term trajectory that we've been stuck on and how baked in the red versus blue attitudes are in this country, it's good to have a lot of people that are just exhausted and miserable because that's a kind of basic condition where people start to say, okay, maybe that's enough. Maybe, you know, I need to rethink how I'm, you know, reacting or responding to political differences these days. And, and so it's, it's fertile soil for change. Um, you know, if we can capitalize on it. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I noticed, and, and I've seen this in real scientific data, but my non-scientific data, of uh, I do what I call these street outrage interviews where I talk to non-experts, non just regular folks about, you know, sort of their news uh, habits and social media habits and things like that. And I don't, you know, it's not, it's just a total listen on, listen mode only kind of thing where I just want to hear where they're at. I don't push back or try to change their minds. And one thing I kind of hear in that, and I think we all have this kind of blind spot sometimes, is I hear this, yeah, they're really upset about it, then almost in the same sentence, they'll sort of end that sentence is sort of like, because the other side, I have to do it because the other side's so bad. And I don't know if you have anything to like, what, how do we deal with that, that we kind of have this blind spot when we're doing it? Yeah, it's totally true. And unfortunately, of course, that we mirror each other. And so, you know, half the country views the other half as, uh, you know, the problem and um, and the worst problem, right? Not climate change, not guns, not, you know, the economy, but them. They're the most, uh, the biggest threat to the country right now. There is a thing that uh, this is also comes from research that the Pew Trust does and, and more in common, but there is a thing that they call the perception gap, which is that whether, whatever side you're on, you believe that those on the other side have more extreme attitudes and more extreme actions and reactions in politics than they actually do. Um, and, and the gap is pretty large. There's a, there's a quiz you can take, which is on the perception gap that More in Common has on their website. I took it last summer. I was off by about 30%. In other words, my view of more conservative Americans or Republicans was that they were much more extreme than they actually are. And I knew what <laughs> what the assessment was was asking me, right? right? So you'd think that I would be moderating that a little bit. So most of us are just wrong about how, ex how extreme the other side actually is. And that plays into this, right? It plays into, you know, it's, it's easier to get triggered and feel a sense of outrage when you really feel like there's an imbalance here um, that you know one side is more responsible than the other or one side is more reasonable than the other and just our kind of ethnocentric tendencies as humans that our groups are better and warmer and cozier and you know superior to the other group and that's what we're you're seeing on both sides mm -hmm. and, and you've probably seen a lot of the same research, but some of the things that, that I've looked at and some of the, the scientists I've had on have kind of talked about if you can lower that perception gap, you know, close that yeah. gap, that can have a really big effect on sort of improving dialogue. It can. I mean, again, the problem, the problem with the problem that we're in, the time that we're in, is that there are so many triggers. There are so many factors that are working in concert to pull us apart and one of them is, yes, our misperceptions, our assumptions about the other. And so being mindful of that, you know, can be an awakening and it can lead to an adjustment. But it's very hard to stay there because as soon as you go on Twitter or you go to turn the news on or pick the newspaper up or you talk to a friend, 
and they tell you about the, you know, the inane thing that the other side just did, we automatically get sucked back into this dynamic. It's a very hard thing to break out of and understanding that you're wrong most of the time in your assessment of them can help loosen the grip of that, but it's not really sufficient to moving the needle against this whole, you know, culture of contempt that we're living in. Yeah, well, I, 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 this wasn't the direction I was going to go in, but um, I mean, this is one of the key things of all this is sort of this whole, I mean, the outrage industry, the angertainment, yeah. whatever we you know, whatever terms we want to use for it. You know that all there's so many, as you noted, there's so many incentives. It's not there doesn't have to be a conspiracy here. There's just yeah. so many different players that have an incentive to encourage this kind of behavior that. Yeah. Um, you know, and so do you see, you know, you see it in politicians, they want to do it, it kind of simplifies things, I can kind of create this black and white version yeah. of the world. You know, you see it with obviously social media and, and also cable news and all that they want to get those clicks and likes and watches and get you agitated all the time. So there's just yeah. so many parts of this that have kind of intrinsic or, or uh, in turn, you know, a deep nature to them. So I mean, do you have any thoughts? Or have you stumbled into some research that helps with some of that that sees some ways out of those changing those incentives? Yeah, so the way I try to think about the time we're in is that it's it's unusual. It's not a typical, you know, polarization, political polarization is not a bad thing in a country like ours with the two-party system. You want to have passionate, true believers on both sides kind of pushing each other and you acting as a check and balance. So it's an important thing to have, but we've really gone off the rails in terms of our views of them and how threatening we see the other side and how overly simplistic our understanding of the issues and their motives and our side becomes in a dy dynamic like that. And so I I try to talk about this as, as not a, you know, it's not driven by any one thing. It's not gerrymandering. It's not the incentive structures of social media platforms or mainstream media to get our attention, to keep us outraged. It, all of these things contribute you know 2010 the like button came on to social media and then social media was transformed from something where i was just sharing some you know news of my life with my friends to something where i was getting you know af affirmations i was you know suddenly addicted to people saying oh you're wonderful you're doing extraordinary things you know so all of these things mattered donald trump and his particular approach to leadership mattered these were all are all accelerants uh, on a basic tendency that we have as humans to be tribal and to sort of, you know, compete with the other side, particularly when the stakes are high. And in our political elections, the stakes couldn't be higher. There's so much money and power and, you know, attention that's involved, that's uh, at risk or at stake in our elections um, that, you know, people will sort of be mobilized so, sort of our worst uh, enemy or our worst angels will be mobilized. So there's a constellation of things that are happening. And so what I try to do when I talk about it, what I've, what I've been doing is, you know, when people will say, yeah, but what about, you know, whatever, you know, what about the fact that the right is, you know, more extreme or they lie more, right? Or what about, well, all, you know, all of the what abouts, all of the pieces of this puzzle that we're kind of trapped in are true and valid. They're kind of sources of our division. But none of them alone could lead to a, you know, what we're in, which is a 60-year pattern of escalating enmity and hate for the for the other side. And so it's important to understand that there is a constellation of things that are working, and they work in what we call vicious cycles. They basically are things that feed other things. And so how we feel, how we see, uh, where we travel, where we don't travel, the news we read and the news we don't read right, the algorithms that separate us, all of these things operate together and reinforce, you know, tendencies in us that keep us sort of addicted to this sense of outrage and enmity. Um, and so what I've tried to talk about and cite in my work, we basically have been studying societies, divide, deeply divided societies that at some point just stopped and pivoted out of it and said, enough. We don't want to live like this anymore. We don't want to, you know, have, suffer from civil violence or political violence or even international violence. We really want to take a different track. And what are the conditions where they, that happens? And that's one of the reasons why an exhausted middle majority is basically a necessary condition 
for that kind of dramatic change. You saw it, for example, in Costa Rica in 1948. They came out of a bloody civil war. Thousands of people had been killed. And they really said, we don't want to live like this anymore. We don't want this to ever happen again. So what are the policies? What are the you know, educational platforms that we need to, you know, infuse our young people so that we can grow a more peaceful society. Like, what do we do to change course? And so we've been studying these kinds of societies that pivot out of this. And that's what in the book, The Way Out, what I try to do is sort of offer, you know, kind of five principles that we've seen other nations or other groups use to escape these kinds of traps, these kinds of com complex overwhelming traps you know again it i liken it to an addiction the political uh, culture that we're in because it's not just you know my attitudes and it's not just our relationship it's what we call a biopsychosocial structural problem so there are biological things that are happening neurological things that are happening that keep us processing certain information and not processing other information there are, you know, psychological things that are happening, our feelings and our emotions, you know, play key into this and play into this. But then there are incentive structures. And then there are, you know, again, where we travel and don't travel, the media we watch and don't watch, where we shop and don't shop. You know, the fact that we're physically moving away from the other side, which is something we're seeing not only in rural, the ur rural urban divide, but within cities. So there is this sort of big constellation of things. The question is, how do you escape that? And that's, I wrote this book because uh, I, like you, felt like there were some really fantastic analyses of why we're stuck in a 60-year pattern, but not much insight into what to do about it. So we studied nations and societies that were able to escape traps like this and identified what we call scientific principles, which again, are things that you can apply to you, your life every day. There are things that you can apply if you decide to sort of reach out and talk to somebody on the other side. You can apply these principles to how you do that and when you do that. Um, but these are also principles that can be used in, in community-based groups that come together, right? Because the good news is that in this country, there are thousands of community-based organizations around the country that are trying to bring people together and have decent conversations and get to know each other and spend time together and eventually find common ground and, and work together to solve problems that they both care about. So these principles that I talk about, these sort of five things are helpful uh, uh, across all of those levels, right? For you, your relationships, your own in-group, you know, the fact that the people that you are comfortable talking politics with, your friends, your colleagues, your peers, you know, people at the diner, you know, we're not as honest with them as we maybe used to be because it's uh, our cultures, our, our tribes have tightened up. And if people start to express, you know, compassion for the other side, we shut them down. You know, we don't we don't have tolerance for that anymore. Well, that's a big problem. So loosening that up in terms of your own in-group dynamics and then loosening up your ability, your intentions, your capacity to reach out across the divide and and then to work in your community together with, with others that are different from you. All of those things can help us ourselves loosen up, you know, the addiction we have to this type of outrage and contempt, but also in our families, in our workplaces, in our sports teams, in our communities. You know, the, the, the effects of these principles can scale from us all the way up. Mm hmm yeah, so you know, you talk about uh, se several things, and I one of them I, I I thought was well, they're all all pretty interesting. But one thing I thought I'd jump to, and we, we may jump around with we talk about yeah, five things. Okay. We may not do them in order, but uh, yeah. but you know, you talk about this idea of uh, you know, you talk about we, we all kind of, or we certainly, if you follow in the science, or you kind of get this idea, of we we tend to oversimplify things sometimes, and and uh, you know, we have these th those are pretty common tendencies to do that. It's kind of a survival skill. We we couldn't yeah. live if we didn't do that. And this particularly is true when you're in uncertain times and in stressful times. Yeah. But that, so you talk about we need to intentionally complicate our lives, and that seems sounds super counterintuitive. So, so yeah. tell me a little bit about that. Well, again, you know, there's a lot of research on this in different areas. But one of the things we have a lab that we call the Difficult Conversations Lab, where we bring people who come who 
are opposed on some moral issue. And we have studied for decades now the conditions under which those conversations go well or go poorly. And so if we take a, a divisive issue, say like abortion, and we bring people in on different sides of that, if I do what the news tends to do, or the best news, tends, the better news tends to do, which is, you know, provide both sides of an argument. So if I if I bring you in, and I know you have a position on this, and I show you a, the pro-life and pro-choice talking points, and I give you that information, um, like, you know, dichotomized like that as either or, then what happens typically is people read it, but they really only pay attention to the information that they're comfortable with and that resonates for them. And the other stuff they just ignore or deny or really kind of pass over. So when they come into the conversations, they come in prepared for the argument. They come in prepared for the hunt, right? And so it becomes then a debate and a game and, a, and, and they're, they're really stoked to win their side. If we take the same information, the pro-life, pro-choice talking points, but say to them, this decision around abortion has a lot of different kinds of dimensions to it. There's health dimensions, there's religious dimensions, there's personal shame, there's the legal elements of it, right? The, the court rulings. There are many different dimensions of this. It's a complicated thing. And here are some of the different dilemmas people face. So if we basically present the same information, but lay it out to people as what it is, which is a complicated set of decisions and actions that people have to think through, then the conversations are fundamentally different. The conversations are much more nuanced. People are able to hear each other. People are more open to learning from the other side. They don't feel like they're in a game to win, you know, a high stakes game to win. They feel like, you know, they, they tend to approach it more as a, a, a learning space where they can learn more about this complicated set of issues. And so that's what, that is a principle that we scale up. So let me tell you what, how, you know, how do you do that? How do you do that in your life? Let me tell you how I do that. So about two years ago when I wrote this book and, you know, politics is as ugly as it is and it's addictive as it is. The news is so, you know, um, attention demanding. Um, I, I, I forced myself to identify five individuals that I think are smart, well-intentioned, uh, and well-informed, but hold opposing political views to mine, right? They're on the other side of the political fence. And what happens now, what I force myself to do as a habit now, is when the news breaks on a Trump indictment or when the news breaks on a you know, whatever, so, something that becomes immediately politicized, which is pretty much everything in the news. When that news breaks, I force myself not only to go to my comfort news that I, you know, seek automatically to tell me what I want to hear, but I force myself to either follow or check out these other voices. Because what I found is they often challenge some of my basic assumptions and they definitely move me out of my comfort zone but they make me smarter about the issues. They give me a more realistic and nuanced understanding of, of what we're facing. And so, and let me be clear, I still watch the news I like to watch. Um, and I don't plug into the, the nutbags out there that's, you know, <laughs> late at night or on the news and are saying things that I think are ridiculous, ridiculous and paranoid. I don't follow them, but I do try to force myself to attend to listen, think with uh, other people that have very different political views from, from myself, but as I said, are decent, well-intentioned and smart. That's how, one way I just complicate my understanding of very complicated issues that are always coming up, that are always being oversimplified, often being very oversimplified in the news. Um, and if you're listening to just one side of the news, you're really just getting half the story so you have to kind of force yourself to reach out and identify the other half. Um, and let me just say one other thing, I'll shut up about this, but there are good sources that help you do this. There's a group, for example, called The Flip Side. And The Flip Side is a, is a daily email you can sign up for. And it's, uh, it's put together by a colleague of mine. Basically what they do is they read sort of 30 legitimate news sources a day, They'll take one issue, you know, China, what's happening in Ukraine, you know, but one issue from the headlines. And then they basically present you 
what progressives think about it, you know, smart, well-intentioned progressives and what um, uh, conservatives think about it um, and where they, you know, where they come together and where they diverge. But it gives you, again, a more realistic understanding of what is going on with this issue. It's a five minute read. You can get it in your email every day and it just keeps you on your toes, right? You don't get sort of lulled into the, you know, the the positions of your side. You're oftentimes challenged and challenged by good people. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've taken some, I don't know if this has happened to you or you've heard anything yeah. like this, but I've taken some heat for people that say that, you know, those of us kind of talking about polarization and bridging divides, we're sort of part of the problem because we're sort of masking these bigger problems, which are like the real problem is radicalization on the right or, or anti-democratic things. And by talking about polarization, it, feel, it makes everybody feel good, but it's not helping yeah. us solve any problems. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, well, so I've spent, you know, I don't know, 40 years now working in conflict and conflict resolution, and it's not a feel-good industry. <laughs> we spend a lot of time in heat. We spend a lot of time in very difficult conversations and trying to reach very difficult solutions. And this is no different than all of that. This is not, you know, being nice and getting along. This is basically trying to avoid civil war and the spikes in political violence, to keep us in conversation in ways that are reasonable. I think the problem is that humans have a hard time holding two contradictory thoughts in their head at the same time. And there are two contradictory realities right now. We need to fight for those things that we think are true and real and and and, and serious threats to, to, for example, to democracy. And we need to do it in a way that avoids political violence. We need to do both, right? And so that's what I say to my colleagues because I have a lot of colleagues who are peace builders or not peace builders, who are social activists, who are really about this is the time to fight, look at what the Supreme Court is doing, look at what you know the states are doing. It's really time to mobilize and fight. I don't disagree with that. I think civil protests, civil disobedience, marching, I think that's very warranted in times like this. And we don't want to tip into hate and vitriol and oversimplifications of all of them. We need to be able to hold the more nuanced understanding of the other, right? And, you know, Martin Luther King was able to do that. Gandhi was able to do that. There have been many, you know, advocates, social advocates for justice that have been able to hold both. We don't want violence, but we do want justice. How do we shepherd that forward? That's what I say to those folks. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a challenge. <laughs> yeah, it is a challenge. It's not going to go away. But um, again, these are in some ways contradictions, but um, it's not impossible to hold both of those in your head and still function. That's, I think, what uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald said was the definition of intelligence is the ability to hold two contradictory thoughts in your head at the same time and still function. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess it, in some sense you've probably already talked about this a fair bit, but I was going to ask, you know, what have, what are you seeing as some of the most common obstacles to sort of implementing the kind of ideas that you have, the strategies that you have, and and maybe have, have you started to identify some sort of ways to overcome those obstacles? Oh, it's a good question. There are different kinds of obstacles. I mean, obviously, I think the biggest obstacle is that we are so addicted to outrage. People have so much energy for the fight, um, and as you say bridge building seems ludicrous in times like this, you know, when, when people are charging, you know, the Capitol and breaking windows, it's not time to kind of sit down and talk. Right. So I, so I think one part of the obstacles where the energy is and the energy is mostly for the fight on both sides right now, and will continue to spike the closer we get into this election, right. Because of what's at stake. So that's a huge problem. I think another problem has simply just been, how do you get the word out? How do you help people understand some of the principles, some of the, the, the dilemmas that we've been talking about today um, at scale? How do you really do that? And so this, you know, it was about a year ago that I published the book, The Way Out, in 2021. About a year ago, I came to the stark conclusion that, you know, people don't read books anymore. <laughs> Very few of us do. <laughs> 
and you know i've done i don't know 100 podcasts and other kinds of media great but it doesn't you know again it's not getting that the kind of attention we need um so we created something called the challenge and the challenge is again kind of a series of exercises that you can do every day I'm working with a group called Starts With Us, which is founded by Daniel Lebetsky, who is the founder of Kind Bar and other things, um, but he has a nonprofit and they're helping develop this. We have a version of it that's up on their website right now. We're building new tech to make it easier so that it'll come up in your phone every day, like Headspace and say, all right, time to, you know, uh, trying to ad address, time to avoid uh, the civil war, right? <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. And so people will kind of daily do some little thing um, and the, the importance about the structure of this is that it's not a one-time event because so much of the bridge building world is built around that. It's built around things like Braver Angels models of bringing red and blue Americans together for a talk, hour and a half conversation. They can go very well, but that's it. There isn't anything after that, and that's insufficient to a cultural dynamic that we're facing, Right. So we're trying to offer things that are a little bit more longer, ter longer term, um, that work at different levels. So this uh, this challenge is a four week thing. You start with a week of your thinking about you and your contributions to this. The second week is you think about your in group and how do you in reintroduce nuance and tolerance there. The third week is reaching across the divides, such as the walk I took, uh, and the fourth week is then finding organizations that bring red blue americans together to tackle problems in their community together right to sort of mobilize together so it, it, it it's just a set of recommendations or activities they're as light as five minutes a day but they can be a little longer and our idea was you know we basically have been offering this to all of the bridge building organizations because they do these great events but then it's done and that ain't enough, right? So we need to be able to expand the time people spend with each other, how often they're thinking about it. We need to make it both feasible, but also ongoing. So hmm. it has been, you know, basically what I'm talking about is a theory of change. How do we take an idea or a set of ideas from science and then show people how to use them in ways that they can digest and actually, you know, take today and do something with and so that's what we've been trying to do is, and what's interesting is that different groups are taking it up. So we're working with a group in Congress to get congressional staffers to do this. So that, cause I know Congress, Congress people will never do it. They don't have the time, they don't have the patience, but their staffers will, and their staffers will affect what the conversations that are happening with Congress. The, uh, there's a, a colleague of mine who's a member of the Baha'i faith. And so he's taking the challenge and, adapting it for his community in ways that will resonate with them. There are groups in medical schools because the health industry is struggling with this that are applying it there and in, in universities. So we're, we're just encouraging these different sectors, these different groups to pick it up and take it, take it on as they wait, as they will. You know, one of the ideas again is about movement and physical movement and the value of that, not only in loosening, loosening up our own attitudes, but connecting with other people. Um, so my fantasy is that, um, you know, Nike will say, we, lo we love that. We don't need the rest of it. We don't need the complicated. We just want the movement stuff because that's what we do. Um, so great. Nike, take it. Do it. You know, <laughs> because all of these corporations, organizations, whether they're religious organizations or business organizations or otherwise, are, are, are riddled with divisions internally. Right. Colleges and universities are struggling with this. You name it. All of our major institutions have these deep political divides and need to start to work with their own communities to figure out how to do this. So take these activities and start to disseminate them and encourage them within your community. It may be very different for high school students than it will be for members of Congress. Great. So then adapt it, right, and change it. But stay close to the science because the science is what will ultimately serve you in having an impact. Mm -hmm. So is that uh, what you sort of suggest for listeners that are sort of looking to a way to looking for some concrete advice or steps to take would maybe be to t start this challenge? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, again, they can read the Time Magazine articles that I've referred to because that just sort of describes how this can work. Um, they can pick up the book if they're interested in the science and going into that. But I think the challenge is tr we're trying to just make it useful for humans, for people, everyday people, um, you know, on different sides of the divide to, uh, and, you know, and I, I'm trying to work with some conservative groups. I've been working with the Mitch McConnell Institute in Kentucky and, you know, there are a variety of different organizations that I've affiliated and associated with that are more conservative um, or religious organizations. Um, and yeah, those, these are these are just opportunities where, as I said, we're, we've, we're taking what is now on the website that starts with us. Again, it's called the it's called the Finding the Way Out Challenge. It's a political detox challenge. Um, but they can go there today and just check it out and see if there's anything that's useful to uh, for them. Um, because the website is laid out in a pretty straightforward way. You should be able to navigate it. Um, but it is one way to try, to begin to try to take some responsibility yourself. Um, I will say the one thing we found when I did it a year ago with a group of people um, is that it's really, helped to, it's really helpful to do it as a group. Hmm. If you want to do it with your family, if you want to do it with your friends at the diner, if you want to do it in a, in a class, if you want to do it in a um, religious organization, right? Um, it, it's helpful because what happens is you try these things out and at the end of the week, you want to talk about them because sometimes um, they they make you miserable. You know, you tried to reach out to somebody and they laughed at you and you think, oh, what am I doing this for? You know, <laughs> So it's really good to talk about that and to share those moments. And there are these kind of surprising things that happen where people say, you know, I was I wasn't going to do this exercise. I did it, and you know what? It made a big difference to me. And so, you know, having those conversations and debriefing like that with people that you're comfortable with will make it all the more useful and formative for people. I strongly encourage that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I I could speak about this stuff with you forever, but I know we can't. But I really appreciate the time, Dr. Coleman. I appreciate those insights. I mean, I think this the audience is really gonna gonna enjoy this. Fantastic. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to have it. And if you if your listeners have have questions, reach out to me. You can find me on you know I'm on the I'm probably all over the web. Okay, and we'll make sure to have that info in the show notes as well. Great. That sounds great. Very good. All right. Take care. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. For links to everything we talked about on this episode, go to outrageoverload.net. Before you leave, let me tell you about our Facebook group. Join in to connect with like-minded listeners, discuss the show, and shape its future. Share your thoughts on outrages, give us feedback, suggest guests, and be part of a growing community. Visit outrageoverload.net slash join. And contact me on Twitter or Instagram, at Mr. Blog, and just say hi. Thanks for listening, and remember, together we can lower the temperature.